This is Revival in Reformation Television. Keep watching. Welcome to Bring It On, a Q&A session on Bible and doctrines. Bring It On, real life issues and authentic scriptural answers. You can send your questions through our social media handles. Let's join in today's episode. Good morning, viewers. Hello again. Good afternoon. Good evening from wherever you may be watching. I want to specially welcome you to our program, Bring It On, where we deal with real life issues using authentic scriptural answers. With me, I am super excited. Today, I have our own Bishop Abraham Olaleye. Good morning, sir. <laughs> Welcome. Good, good morning, sister. Ehi. Thank you very much for what you do for the Lord and uh, the education, enlightenment mm. that you bring through this Q and A. Questions. God bless you. Yes, sir. We am, I am particularly excited yeah. to have you. <laughs> to go be the glory. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so... Today we have a very interesting question. I can't wait to hear it. Very interesting. Okay, so I'm going straight into it. The question says, during Jesus' ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, the two men in white apparel told the believers present, this is what they said, mm -hmm. men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you in, into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In his teaching, according to a popular preacher, those two men, the angels we are talking about, mm -hmm. did not know what they were saying. Wow, wow, wow. This preacher said that Jesus did not ascend, but Instead of ascending into heaven, mm -hmm. Jesus disappeared into the bodies of the believers everywhere in the world. Wow. So is this true, this statement? And can you please explain this to our viewers? Well, that, that's an interesting question, and uh, which will subject us to uh, scriptural scrutiny. You know, we have the scripture, the Holy Bible, that contains God's word, God's information, to guide us in, in when, this, when questions like this arise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to believe the scripture as they were given. And um, uh, that's what we call the ascension. You know, what is the full gospel that Jesus uh, suffered, you know, on the cross? Mm -hmm. And that's the passion, the passion of Christ. Then he died. Then he was buried. And then he rose from the dead. And then lastly, he ascended up to heaven from where he came. So, and that's the complete gospel. When you believe those pillars, then you are in faith. And you are a candidate for heaven. You are a child of God. Okay? okay? So, he ascended to heaven. Okay. So, that's why those two men which are obviously angels in white apparel, said to the men, you know, the disciples and all other believers around, that you don't need to stare gazing up to this sky, you know. I'm sure by the time the cloud took him out of their sight, mm -hmm. the, the angels said to them, don't worry, he's going to come back the same way. And that is what we call the second coming of Christ. When his feet will touch the ground, okay, yeah, and that's the second coming. What happens before then is the catching up of the saints that we call the rapture. And all these things are buttressed in scripture and, and consistent with the characters of God from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, but now we are looking at the ascension matter. Jesus truly ascended to heaven. He did not vanish into the hearts or bodies of believers. Okay, he left the Holy Spirit to do that mm. on the day of Pentecost. And the man who was there, a witness, I'm talking about Luke the physician, the same man who wrote the gospel according to his name and continued with Acts of Apostles and devoted it to 
a nobleman called Theophilus said, on that day, a, 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 a wind, a great wind of the Spirit came, and a cloven tongue as of fire, he was describing what he saw, you know, <laughs> rested, divided itself, and rested on each of the believers, and they spoke with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? That was a classic report of what had happened after Jesus had ascended to heaven. Okay. Remember, Jesus had said in previous scripture that it's expedient of me for you that I go. Mm -hmm. If I do not go away, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit will not come. He didn't say, if I do not vanish or disappear into the body of believers. So, he ascended mm -hmm. to heaven. And when he got to heaven, guess where he sat? Or he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Okay. And that's why Romans will later tell you uh, in chapter 8, and this is very interesting, so that we can have scripture, so that we can deal with scripture, so that we can know what the scripture has really said as against what we could call speculation or another gospel. Here it tells us, um, he said, he who is he who condemns? Romans 8, 34. It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen, okay, it's not done, who is even where? At the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is not a spirit being at the right hand of God. He sits at the right hand of God, like I can see you seated here, and is interceding for the church. But if you think that this scripture is not enough, then you go back again to Hebrew scripture, okay. Psalm 110. And this is what I call how beautifully the dots connect in the word of God. It's a Psalm of David, and it says, and it says, announcement of the Messiah's reign. Okay, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, in other words, the Lord God Jehovah said to the Lord Jesus Christ, sit at where? My right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Okay, is that scripture? We have scripture number two right now? Yes. Okay, now we now go to another scripture here in Revelations, okay, which is chapter 5. Uh, Revelations 5, I guess I got that. Yes. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, on the back sea with seven seas. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose his seas? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because there was no one found open, was no, because there was no one found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose his services. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the heaven spirits, you know, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll of the right hand of him who sat at the throne. He took it from the right hand of God. Okay? Yes. Okay. He himself sits at the right hand of God. And what does that connote? Authority and power. Because Jesus now, according to Revelation 1.5, is the true witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all the kings of the earth. So the beautiful thing that we now see in our fourth scripture is Hebrews chapter 1. And that's also a delight to reach, I uh, mean, to read. He said, God, who in various times and in various ways spoke in time past of the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his son. Okay, let me just uh, cease time. Verse 3. Who, now, the son is being described. Who, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself poured our sins, what did you say? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus is physically seated at the right 
hand of God. When such person said that Jesus vanished, he did not go to, uh, into ascension, you have cut off the gospel. You have destroyed what is the essence of the gospel. He ascended, but guess how many years before that has been prophesied in Psalm? Almost 700 years that sit at my right hand until I make your enemy your first two. Eh? Wow. This has brought a lot of <laughs> clarity as against what we are hearing, that Jesus disappeared. But also, can I ask a question? Could it be that he was trying to say maybe Jesus is now in the hearts of people? Could that be? Mm, yes, if we say Jesus is in our heart, that's all right. Jesus said, when I go, I will not leave you as orphans. Yes. I will come back to you. I am with you now, but when I come back, I will be in, in you, you by the Holy Spirit. Because God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one. So wherever the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is there. And God the Father is there. So it's correct to say, yes, Christ is in us. So therefore, the Holy Spirit is there. Or the Holy Spirit is in us. So Christ is there also. So it does not diminish the fact that Christ, according to scripture, is seated at the right hand of the Father. A place of authority. That nobody else can ever occupy that right hand side of God. But God's unique son. For all that he did. And it's amazing that he's not just sitting there. He's sitting there until all his enemies will be brought under his feet by his father. He says, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. The kings of the earth and their rulers who are against the Lord, the Lord God and his anointed Messiah. Hey, hey. Wow. Okay. Still on this question, Bishop. I think um, there has been some... Um, misunderstanding I've heard a lot of people say this trinity they really don't understand this trinity about God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit I've heard a family member very close to me even say mm, God is God, God is one which is Father, which is Son, which is Holy Spirit so if we say this, this also brings clarity when we say Christ has ascended and is seated on the right hand of the Father. So Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit with us. Now my question is also in prayer. Is it okay, so I need clarity for our viewers because people pray, say they say they pray to Jesus or they pray to the Holy Spirit and it's the same thing as praying to God the Father. So we want clarity in praying as believers. There is nothing that should be confusing to any believer. You see, whatever you say to me about yourself, I have to believe it. You see, this is my father's name, my mother's name. This is where I hail from. It will be out of place to begin to question the veracity or the truthfulness of your claim. So you are who you say you are. Even as a man, how much more when God says, I am a God of Trinity. I reveal myself in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Every human being is of tripartite creation. Spirit, soul, and what? Body. Three. So it pleased the Father that he should exist in that form, in the tripartite form. So at creation of men, he said, come. Let us, that is Jehovah Elohim, let us create men in our image and after our likeness. When Isaiah saw the glory of God in Isaiah 6, is God said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Mm -hmm. You see, see the plural dimension? Yes, yes. And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. So God has shown himself to be trapatite. So why should we have any problem with that? But however, Jesus came and revealed the Father to us. We didn't see God or recognize God as a Father. They saw him as God. They saw him as the, you Almighty. know, invisible one, almighty. 
But Jesus came to introduce to us a father. He takes his son mm. to bring another human being into sonship. A slave or a servant can never reveal a father to you. Yes. A slave cannot say to another slave, hey, this, this my boss is your father. Is he the father of that same person? No. But he took Jesus, his son, to say, hey, I want you to know this God the way you have never known before. Mm. I want you to see him as a great God, a kind God. And we call him Abba. Mm. He said, so when he taught them to pray, he said, say, our father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Wow. Your kingdom come. And we now know that his kingdom has come when Jesus came to the earth. His kingdom come and his will is being done on it right now as it is in heaven. So we are happy about that, that he is a trinity God. That is he who says, that is what he say, uh, that is who he says he is. God in the Father, God in the Son, God in the Spirit. And you see them walking together in agreement. Yes. And so because Jesus has given us God the Father, who is above all, he now says, relate with him as a son mm -hmm. to a father. Ask him things in my name. Why? Because I am the access to God. Jesus has now replaced the, the priest of the Old Testament or the high priest, singular, of the Old Testament who stood between a holy God and sinful men. So Jesus has taken that place. He's now our mediator. Okay. Yeah, he has mediated a better covenant. He is our intercessor. He is our advocate. He is our everything. So we no longer need the human priest. We go through the Son of God who has entered into the most holy place only once to obtain eternal redemption to everyone that come to God through him. Beautiful. And the Holy Ghost is doing his marvelous work. See, the God the Father first was revealed. And then God the Son came. And before God the Son came, God the Father began to speak about God the Son through the prophets mm -hmm. in all the Hebrew scripture. And again, characteristics of him, or of them, before Jesus also left, he began to talk about the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, another one is coming, or the third one is coming, who is God the power, who is going to feed you and enable you. And so Peter will give testimony about Jesus later in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him in he. So what is our problem? This is Revival in Reformation Television. Keep watching.